So, thank you, Samar, for that kind introduction and also for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back in the UK where I spent many happy years as a student more <coughs> years ago than I care to remember. Uh, I'm particularly glad to be back in Liverpool, which is one of my favorite cities. I've loved to watch it grow and change over the years, so it's, it's good to be reacquainted. Some are mentioned that I'm no longer in Boston, that's true. I'm now living and working in Cornell Medical School in New York City. But the reason for that is that my wife, Lori Glimsher, who is possibly the world's best known immunologist, is the dean of Cornell Medical School. I moved from Harvard to take that job five years ago. And when your wife says to you, you're going to join the faculty here, right? <laughs> You understand what the godfather, Don Vito Corleone, <laughs> meant by an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> so, I want to talk about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I think there are very few things that intelligent people fear more. Right? I call it the soul evil, because it robs you of who you are, leaving the body essentially intact. And, a more hideous fate for people who live by their wits is hard to imagine. Let me start by explaining the dimensions of this problem. I always start my lectures by trying to tell people why I do what I do. Of course, it's true that no one is an island, particularly in science. And virtually all of the work that I've done of consequence has been done in collaboration with my Brandeis colleague, Dagmar Ringa, about whom more in a while. And these people did the bulk of the experiments that I'm going to be talking about in collaboration with a team of people from Columbia University who've been wonderful collaborators. This is my grandson. He was one year old when this picture was taken four years ago. And this is his great-grandfather, my wife's father, who was 87 years old. I barely knew my grandparents. They died in their 50s, which is when people who were born in the 19th century typically died. But most children born today are going to know one or more of their great-grandparents, and that's new. And this is why it's happening. When my grandson was born, he was born into a world in which only a handful of countries, colored in blue, have more than 20% of a population over the age of 65. But when my grandson is 40, the world he and you will be living in will look like this. Note the UK, <laughs> which, as I said at the moment, still consists of Scotland and Ireland as well. <laughs> That's the only Brexit joke you'll get from this, in case you've been worried about that. Did you know that in the West, the fastest growing demographic group are people over the age of 80? When I was born, there were fewer than 2 million of them. Now there are 11 million of them. This is in the US. And there are 32 million of them projected when my grandson is 40. Scale this by the relative populations of the UK and the US, and you'll see what the world is in for that you know. Now, normally, you'd consider this a good thing. We're living longer. But old age is a risk factor for almost all the thousand natural shocks that Hamlet said flesh is heir to. And especially, this is true, for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders for which your risk increases exponentially when you hit, well, just about exactly my age. <laughs> and that is a colossal problem. Because as the world's <coughs> population ages rapidly, so too the number of people with these disorders increases extremely rapidly. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that if dementia were a country, right now, dementia would have more people than Canada. All right? And by the time my grandson is 40, 
dementia worldwide will be more people than the population of Russia or Japan or Mexico. It would be the ninth most populous country in the globe. That's an unsustainable future in terms of healthcare systems everywhere. And it's even worse than you think because dementia, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and the other neurodegenerative diseases are the only leading causes of death for which there is not only no treatment whatsoever, but the only ones that have actually been increasing in terms of their mortality, the mortality rate over the last 20 years, even cancer been dropping like a stone compared to these diseases. Right now, in the West, neurodegenerative diseases are either the sixth or seventh leading cause of death, depending on how you count things. And within 30 years, they're going to be third. As I said, no treatment whatsoever. OK, so now you know why I do what I do. We've got a very limited amount of time to solve this problem, and it needs as many people as possible working on it. I want to focus on one neurodegenerative disease. I'll actually talk about Parkinson's a little at the end, but I'm going to focus on Alzheimer's disease. It is the center ring in the big tent circus of neurodegeneration, by far the most prevalent neurodegenerative disease. More than 100 years ago, a young German neurologist, Alois Alzheimer, was brought by her husband, a patient named August Dieter, who had begun to develop signs of severe dementia. This was particularly interesting to Alzheimer because August Dieter, when he first saw her and when this picture of her was taken, was 51 years old. Alzheimer's disease is a disease of aging, but it is not exclusively a disease of the aged. In the UK right now, there are about 800,000 people with Alzheimer's disease but there are 50,000 of them under the age of 65. Most of them have the disease early onset because, like August Dieter, they have mutations in one or more of the specific genes that guarantee you will get Alzheimer's disease, and these genes are always mutated in a neurosomal dominant fashion. August Dieter had a mutation in a gene called presenilla. Uh, we now know this because her DNA was sequenced. It was actually extracted from Alzheimer's notebooks that had slices of her brain tissue after her death and sequenced by a team in Germany. We know the mutation that led to the disease that killed her, and Alzheimer herself noted that the disease ran in her family. But she was the first Alzheimer's patient by name. And when she died four years after this picture was taken, because hers was a very aggressive form of the disease, that Alzheimer found in looking at her brain two things that shouldn't have been there. One was this dense deposit outside the dying neurons that he called senile plaques, and which we now call amyloid plaques, and that contain a peptide called a beta. And inside the dying neurons, he saw also aggregates of proteins, which he called neurofibrillary tangles because they differed in shape and characteristic from the plaques. We now know that the plaques are made up of a peptide that is carved out of a much larger protein. The larger protein is APP, the Alzheimer's precursor protein. Peptide is called the A-beta peptide, and it's typically 42 <coughs> residues in length. We know that the tangles inside the cell are made up largely of a microtubule stabilizing protein called tau. What we don't know is which comes first, the chicken or the egg, and what matters from the point of view of the disease. However, this observation of Alzheimer's has led to a streetlight effect in terms of trying to find therapies for Alzheimer's disease. What do I mean by a streetlight effect? Well, I mean, it's basically the old joke. It's a man drunk on the ground under a streetlight. The policeman comes up and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. The policeman says, I'll help you look. Where'd you drop them? And the drunk says, over there by my car. And the policeman says, why are you looking here? The drunk says, the light's better here. <laughs> and that's the problem, right? This is the light 
that was shown on Alzheimer's disease for most of the last century. And so it's what people assumed they needed to go after from a therapeutic perspective. How successful has this been? Not very. And let me explain why. First of all, we now know that although the plaques are fibrillar and make up, are made up largely of a cross beta structure formed from the misfolded protein, peptide in this case, a beta peptide, we also know that a large number of other structures are formed. And you've heard about some of those in earlier talks at this meeting. And we don't know which of these is the toxic species. Most people think this is probably not toxic, and these are. But believe it or not, that's not been established. Not really been established for any neurodegenerative disease. It's all pretty much hypothetical at this point. It gets worse. All right? APP, the protein from which the A-beta fragment is carved out by the sequential action of two proteases, beta and gamma secretase, isn't the only fragment made, of course. You've got this fragment, you've got this fragment, you've got this fragment, and there's a non-amyloidogenic pathway that seems to be benign and might even be beneficial that produces other fragments as well. Good luck figuring out which of these are important. This is the one that forms outside the cell, so the street light shines on that, but all this other stuff gets made all the time. So your guess is as good as mine as to which species is the toxic species. And what if it isn't A-beta at all? What if it's tau? What if A-beta is just a trigger for tau? Or what if A-beta doesn't have anything to do with the process and it's merely symptomatic? And tau is what matters. What if A-beta and tau both don't matter? And something else really is responsible. And this has enormous implications for therapy. If Alzheimer's disease is, as I think it is, an A-beta-dependent tauopathy, where tau might be actually the toxic species, then, of course, targeting A-beta will only work in the, to the extent that you can use it to influence what happens to tau. But there could be two parallel paths, or, as I said, neither of these might have anything to do with the toxicity uh, to the neurons, and that may be caused by some other totally unrelated or related. You can see now why, in the last 25 years, the success rate for Alzheimer's clinical trials has been 0.5%. And the one drug that has been approved in that time doesn't do much. The bottleneck occurs at a fascinating place. If you look at things like drug resistance as a target, hepatitis virus as a target, there's a fairly steady drop off in the compounds that make it through the various stages of clinical trials. If you look at neurodegenerative diseases, the immense bottleneck occurs not in safety. Most of the drugs that are taken into clinical trials for neurodegenerative diseases get past the initial safety but in phase two, which is efficacy, where 80% of the drugs drop out. Efficacy, think about that. Hundreds of millions of dollars go into the development of drugs that work on their targets in vitro, work on their targets in animal models, possibly work on their targets in cell culture models, and then when you actually put them to human patients, they don't do it. This suggests to me that our animal models for toxicity are pretty good, but our animal models for neurodegenerative diseases in particular are in fact terrible. In fact, they might be worse than terrible. They might be irrelevant. Irrelevant is much worse than terrible because irrelevant takes you in the wrong direction. So how do you know you have a relevant target? I believe the only way to establish relevant targets in these diseases is by human genetics. If you know that a mutation in a particular gene either directly causes or prevents or modulates Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, or whatever, then at least you know you are dealing with a target that is disease relevant. 
Absent such information, we don't touch targets in my lab. And human genetics strongly suggests that Alzheimer's disease is an A beta dependent telepathy, okay, in the familial form, like August Peter had, where you have specific mutations in specific genes. And that's about 5% of the total number of cases. But in the other 95%, the genetics, which mostly involve risk factors, as you might imagine, still suggest that the disease is probably an APP-dependent tauopathy. Doesn't necessarily depend on A beta. Probably depends on APP processing, as you'll see in a moment. But that the cause is not mutations. The cause is a barren cellular protein trafficking because virtually all the genes that have been turned up that relate to the sporadic disease affect either APP processing or cellular protein trafficking. So let me give you just an example of what I'm talking about. There's a mutation in certain Scandinavian populations that's protected against Alzheimer's disease. That mutation occurs in APP itself, and the effect of that mutation is to make this a poorer substrate for this first protease that's needed to produce A beta. But remember, that cup doesn't just produce A beta, it also produces all these other fragments. So I'm not saying, oh, this means A beta is important. What I'm saying is this means APP processing is important. And you can see that. I mean, people who have that mutation have an astonishingly low burden. <coughs> of A beta compared to other people. But their level of A beta as a marker for processing is about is less than 50%, that of a normal person in the same age. It's a big change. And compared to a person like August Dieter, who had a mutation that causes Alzheimer's disease, we can see what their level of APP misprocessing is in comparison. So based on all of this, Unlike the strategies that are being followed in most places for Alzheimer's disease, and I hope they'll succeed because we need something, we decided not to pursue any of this stuff because it requires knowing things you don't know. If you're going to make an antibody against the toxic species, you don't know what the toxic species is. I have no idea. The question is, can you treat this disease without knowing that? The dentate gyrus, as close to the entorhinal cortex as Manchester and Liverpool are to each other, the dentate gyrus is completely spare. And so what Scott did was to do transcription and proteome comparisons between these two regions of the same brain. And if you do that for a number of Alzheimer's patients, using the internal undamaged region as your control, not an undamaged whole brain, then you don't get a 1,000 differences between the Alzheimer's portion and the non-Alzheimer's portion. You get about 10. And one consistently stood out above all the others. One was found in every sample. One jumped out like the proverbial sore thumb. And that was VPS35, which is a gene originally discovered in yeast by Matthew Seaman in Scott Emma's lab that is part of a multi-protein complex called retromer. And this is a protein trafficking complex. And this gene was way down in Alzheimer's brains in the vulnerable region. This is electron microscopy of the core retromer complex. And what you can see here is the crystal structures of the individual components fitted into this to make an approximate model of what this might look like. Now, here's some of the data. Right? If you look at these brains, what you see is that in the entorhinal cortex, there's a significant difference in BPS35 compared to the dentate gyrus. Moreover, and this is really interesting, if you look at the other retromer components, they're down too. And in fact, the two, in this case, two of the three are being plotted here, track each other perfectly. So the whole complex is down. It isn't just one component. You're missing a significant amount of the entire retinal protein complex. Right. Now, what effect does this have on A beta? 
Well, Scott was able to show this in both mouse models and in human cortical neurons. What he showed was that if you knock down retinal, you can't knock it out. It's an essential protein complex. If you knock it down with shRNA, A beta levels go up. Okay? What happens if you overexpress it? If you overexpress one of the retinal components, A beta levels go down. And in fact, if you knock it down in a mouse, rendering the mouse haploid insufficient in retinal, the mouse rapidly develops A beta and tau aggregates. So what exactly does retromer do? Well, protein trafficking is very complicated, but retromer is involved primarily in the endocytic protein trafficking pathway, where proteins that are part of the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, are <coughs> endocytosed, taken into the late endosome, and eventually degraded in the lysosome. But if you have retromer around, there's a second fate. Sometimes they're either directly recycled back to the cell surface or taken back to the Golgi for resecretion. And it is the balance between the degradated pathway, which doesn't involve retromer, and the retromer-dependent sorting pathway that recycles proteins that determines the homeostatic level of proteins on the surface of the cell. Proteins like ion channels, neurotransmitter receptors, APP, the Alzheimer's precursor protein. These are all set by this balance of pathways. Let's look at retromer a little bit more. So here's what I just told you. You can recycle, you can go back to the Golgi, or you can degrade. Retromer is these two pathways, and it assembles on tubular vesicles, and it sort of looks like this. There's retromer, we'll blow it up for you. And what you have are a bunch of modules. There's the cargo recognition core complex, which is the one I showed you the electron microscopy of, the three protein complex. And VPS35 is one of these. But in addition, there are tubulation proteins that help you form the tubules. There are membrane recruiting proteins that take you to the membrane in the first place. There are cargo recognition and cargo loading proteins there's the wash complex, which seems to control whether you go this way or that way. And there are specific cargos and receptors for those. Now, one of the cargos, as I said, is APP, the amyloid precursor protein. Here we have a sort of artist's rendition. This is fiction of what this might look like, where you have some of the retromer associated proteins and the core complex itself interacting with cargo inside the tubular portion. You're looking down the tubule of this vessel. OK, what has this got to do with Alzheimer's disease? Very simple. APP, as I said, is a transmembrane protein and is retromer cargo. So as it turns out, is the beta secretase that makes the first cut in APP. They are both retromer. Beta secretase is normally not active on the cell surface. It requires a low pH for activity. <clears throat> that low pH <coughs> develops in the late endosome when beta secretase or APP are on their way to the lysosome. So what happens is the processing that produces those fragments of APP occurs late in this pathway. If you have a lot of retromer, you don't do much of this pathway. You're spending most of your time recycling your cell surface proteins like APP. And even though APP and beta secretase do co-localize here, the pH of the early endosome is sufficiently high, beta secretase has a little activity. That activity develops here. What happens if, as Scott showed in Alzheimer's disease, you're deficient in retromer? What happens is, you do more of this. And this is the pathway that produces A beta, as well as the other fragments of APP that are amyloidogenic at altitude. So this makes a lot of sense. If you have a deficiency in retromer, if cell trafficking is defective, you're going to make more amyloid plaque. 
have all the attendant findings of COVID. Is there evidence that you do have deficiency, not just in retroviral, but in trafficking itself, in Alzheimer's disease? Oh, yeah. Alois Alzheimer himself made a third observation on the brain of Agus Abita. His observation was, in addition to these things, she had an extraordinary heavy accumulation of lipoid granules. Those lipoid granules are enlarged endosomes. And more recently, Randy Nixon okay, at NYU has shown that these enlarged endosomes are the earliest manifestation of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease in both models and in people. So even before you build up any amyloid plaque, you see enlarged endosomes in sporadic AD patients who don't have much plaque burden. So there's a lot of evidence that there are trafficking defects in this disease. But remember, I gotta have human genetics. You should want human genetics too, to be convinced. All right. First of all, let me just show you that biochemically this works. If you make a mouse that is haplo insufficient for retromer, you increase the co-localization of beta secretase and APP, and beta secretase stays in the late endosome longer as it should. Moreover, as I said, the co-localization with APP goes way up, especially in axons, which is where most of the APP and beta secretase if you knock down retromer in these same animals, as I said before, A beta levels go through the roof and you start to build up plaques, all of which makes perfect sense. And this works not just in mice, but it also works in fly. Same thing. You can fix it by overexpressing retromer. You can generate pathology by knocking down. But as I said, we want genetics, we got genetics. So there are de novo mutations, mutations that arise in adulthood that are associated with adult onset Alzheimer's disease. And these are now beginning to be found. One of them is in VPS 35. And there are some more. There are some here in the core complex. There are some here, there are some here, and there are some here. And here. In other words, every component of the retromer dependent pathway has an Alzheimer's gene or an Alzheimer's risk associated gene that maps to it. This is about as good a smoking gun for a geneticist like myself as you could possibly ask for. So, what this says to me is. The way to treat this disease might be to fix this defect. And the way to fix the defect would be to upregulate retro. <clears throat> Increase retro, everything goes down. So how do you do that? Well, you could do it with gene therapy, but there are a lot of genes. Even the core complex has three. That's a formidable challenge for gene therapy. We are exploring this but it is by no means a trivial process. You could increase retro expression, but nothing's known about what controls retro expression. I've got a great student working on this, but we haven't figured it out yet. We could try to prevent the degradation of the retro protein by targeting, say, ubiquitin ligases or whatever, but we don't know which ones are important for the degradation of retro. I've got another student working on that. But there is another strategy, and that strategy is to make drugs that stabilize the protein and protect it against degradation simply by binding to it. And those are called pharmacological chaperones. And there's quite a bit of precedence for that. Uh, for example, in Fabre disease, Anderson Fabre disease, which is a autosomal <coughs> recessive disorder, uh, there, is, there are mutations in a protein called alpha galactosidase. And the alpha galactosidase mutations all destabilize the protein. So we worked with a company called Amicus Therapeutics to develop pharmacological chaperones to stabilize alpha-galactosidase. Here's our crystal structure of one of them bound to 
alpha galactosidase, and this works dramatically to clear up the insoluble aggregates of alpha galactosidase that forms in febrile disease. And I'm delighted to report that two months ago, the EC actually approved this drug for the treatment of febrile disease. And US approval is expected to follow either late this year or early in 2017. So this works. You can stabilize a protein and correct a disorder by binding a small molecule to it. There's only one problem. Actually, there are a lot of problems. First, alpha galactosidase is an enzyme. So you know it binds ligands. We've got an active site to target a weak binding ligand to as a stabilizer. None of the retinal components is an enzyme. And even if we focus on the core complex, okay, where would you put a ligand? Would you put it here? Would you put it here? Would you put it here? Or would you put it here or here? And how do you know? So Vince McCozzi in our lab did a hell of a lot of work using fluorescence binding to find out what the weak link was in the retinal complex. And it turns out, by looking at the relative stabilization of components when you add them to one another, that he was able rapidly to show that the weak link was here, was the interface between VPS29 and our old friend VPS35. And uh, you can see that blown up here. It's this interface region. And that's the weakest part of the whole complex. And so the idea, now you've heard talks about drugs that disrupt protein-protein interactions, right? We've had a number of talks about that. I don't want to do that. I want to stabilize the protein-protein interaction. So I don't want to go into the binding site and break it up. I want to find a cavity where the two proteins come together where I can link them one to another with non-covalent interactions. Uh, the problem for that is where the hell on the surface of this are the cavities that will actually bind the drug. Because if you look at the surface of a protein, or two proteins that are in complex, it's like a Himalayan mountain range, and you have no real way of knowing which of the valleys is actually drug binding. However, all right, we do have individual crystal structures, and we do have crystal structures for the binary complexes. And in particular, we have a crystal structure of this complex where the weak link exists. So, okay, how do you find a binding site? Tom Blundell mentioned in his wonderful lecture that the earliest use of fragments in drug discovery, the invention, if you will, of that idea, dates back to Dagmar Ringa's classic work from 1993. And this is just a reminder from that paper about the, about her expression of the idea of taking fragments, looking at them in crystals, and then linking them. What most people forget is that although she did use this in the, in the second year, the year after this, to make a drug this way, make a molecule that bound to a protein, this wasn't the reason for which she actually invented the technology in the first place. She invented the technology to map binding surfaces on proteins to throw fragments of drugs at proteins and to find those pockets that were druggable. And so we decided to use this to do that. Since Dagmar's part of the team, of course, it was a logical thing to do. But this is the method. You take fragments of drugs, you throw them into protein crystals, you see where they bind in terms of electron density, here's phenol, and then you look at where they cluster. And where they cluster are the druggable sites. So we did this with those crystals of the binary complex of 29 and 35, where the weak link is. Here, for example, is glycerol bound in a pocket right at that interface. And at the same pocket, here's DMSO bound at the interface. And so you rapidly take that complex surface and focus in on a handful of sites, in fact, three to be precise. And here is the structure of the complex. This is part of VPS 35. This is VPS 29. This is the interface. And there in the back where that stick figure is, is the primary site that we targeted first. All right? Here is the Alzheimer's causing mutation. 
Parkinson's called a mutation, more about that later. And a mutation we made to do something else will show up in the back. But now opposite this pocket, where we did most of our targeting originally, our solvent mapping approach found two additional pockets, one here and one over here near this residue. And you can see in a second where those cavities are. Here's one of them, here's the other. And so although I will show you the results for targeting that cavity on the back, we're still actively looking at molecules that bind to these two places on the protein surface as well. OK, so this is a blow up of that complex again. And just zooming in on that cavity in the back that we're going to be talking about from here on out, there it is. You can see it. Vince showed that the retromer complex unfolds at about 50 degrees. This whole thing basically comes apart at about 50 degrees. So the idea is to find compounds that increase that stability. Most of the compounds that we did, we found by in silico screening. So we took a library of 65,000 compounds and we docked them to that site I showed you. Then we looked at the top 100. We begged, borrowed, bought, or stole those, and then see if they bind for real. Most did nothing. One, this one, and another, which is an analog of this one, did something. This analog did nothing. This is what the best analog did. It increased the melting temperature of the retromer complex by 10 degrees. That's a lot. That's a big stabilization. And it did so at 5 micromolar <coughs> kD. Okay. Here is the compound in the site in which it binds. And you can see how it makes interactions with both DPS35 and DPS29, bridging between the two. More about the chemical structure of the compound later. All right. Here. At the binding site, we decided to mutate a glutamine that was in the back of the compound to a bulkier residue, a tryptophan, to see what effect that would have on binding. And as we hoped, it abolishes binding completely. So it looks like the binding and the stab stabilization are fairly specific for a single site. Well, what happens when you actually then use this compound? And look at what it does for retromer levels in cells. If you look at mouse or human hippocampal neurons in culture, what you find is that binding that compound raises the level not only of VPS35, as you might expect, but VPS26, which is at the other end of the retromer complex. The whole complex is stabilized. Right? And by about the same amount. And if you use, if you look at the expression, you're not changing the expression of the protein at all. It's a stabilization at the level of the protein itself. Now, what does this do for Alzheimer's-related molecules? First, if we're increasing trafficking by increasing retromer, we should be taking APP out of the late endosome. And indeed, when you treat with a the drug, there's only about half as much APP in late endosomes as there were before treatment. What does this do for a beta production? A beta goes down. Both 42 and 40 length fragments of a beta go down by about the same amount. What's more, the reduction is dose dependent. And if you plot the reduction in a beta as a function of the increase in retromer for the different doses, you see that as you increase retromer, a beta goes down, and it's a perfectly linear correlation. So you can sort of dial the level of A beta you want. The analog that didn't work in vitro doesn't do anything in vivo either. OK, so far so good. But these are not good Alzheimer's models. These are models that involve taking cortical neurons from animals or from people and then overexpressing APP or overexpressing A beta peptides or overexpressing presenilin mutations, doing all kinds of things to jitter the model of that. What we wanted to do was to look at human neurons from human patients. 
So with the help of Larry Goldstein's lab, we got pretty good at deriving neurons from skin cells via induced pluripotent stem cells. And so we did that with Alzheimer's patients. And I want to show you the first examples of that. This is not published yet. All right. Here's what happens if you use one of our compounds on patient-derived neurons. What you find is that you get a drug. These neurons, by the way, they produce a lot of A-beta and a lot of phosphotal, and they have shorter lifetimes than neurons derived from normal controls. Our compound dramatically reduces A-beta in both its forms. In various, this is one patient, this is another patient, this is another patient, and so forth. And although I'm not showing you the data, it also reduces tau. Concomitantly, aggregates of tau also go down by about the same amount. So it looks like, and these are sporadic patients. These are not genetic patients. Patients with sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So it looks like there's a chance that this strategy of fixing the cellular defect could work for <coughs> sporadic disease patients, and that's 95% of patients. Well, if you are, in fact, blocking this pathway, not blocking, but sort of redirecting away from this pathway towards this pathway, this is the only thing that should go down, right? This should go down, this should go down, this should go down, and this should go up. That's exactly what happens. When you treat with the compound, these all go down. This goes up. So we are not only rerouting trafficking, we're rerouting it into the correct path. The non amyloidogenic, non toxic path. And this, by the way, is exactly what you see when you look at that mutant that reduces the processing of APP, that protective Scandinavian mutant. It's also what you see when you use a chemical inhibitor of this protease. Same thing happens. You go down in these fragments and you go up in this one. So, all of the data suggests that the approach is doing what we want it to do. That doesn't mean it's going to help patients. It's a little far cry from that. But at least it looks like there's a reasonable chance that it's worth trying in patients. Okay? And maybe not just Alzheimer's patients. Because if you look at the genetics again, there aren't only retromutations that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Different mutations in the same genes actually will give you familial Parkinson's. So they're different alleles, but the same genes. And you have two completely different, maybe not so, neurodegenerative diseases. So for this reason alone, we have no molecular basis to think that retro is involved in Parkinson's disease, except this one genetic result. So based purely on this, what we did was to try our compounds and retromer overexpression in models of Parkinson's disease. But the first thing we did was to do what Scott had done for Alzheimer's. Scott and I did it again for Parkinson's. Let's look at the vulnerable regions of the brain of Parkinson's patients. And when you do, Retromer is down. Down, incidentally, by about the same amount that it's down in the vulnerable regions of Alzheimer's patients. By the way, I haven't told you why retromer levels are low in those regions, and I'm not going to because I have no idea. I have two really good people working on this problem, but so far we've not cracked it. We don't know what it is that is producing this low level of retromer in the vulnerable regions of the brain. We have some ideas, but we haven't been able to prove it. But the consequences are dramatic. So it turns out that if you look at genetic forms of Parkinson's disease and look at the mutations that cause genetic Parkinson's disease, they all lower retromer levels in the vulnerable regions of the brain. Right? And they do it for all of the retromer proteins. They're all down. Okay. 
So now let's see if we can fix this. Here is a vector control. What we're looking at is damage to the neurons in a rat model of Parkinson's disease. And what you can see is that if you knock down retromer, the neurons become damaged. If you replace retromer with one of the Parkinson's mutation forms of retromer, the neurons become damaged. If you use one of the other genes that gives rise to Parkinson's disease, the neurons become damaged. But in all of these cases, you can restore neuronal health by treating the animals with the retromer stabilizing drug. And this is not some generic neuroprotective effect, because if you look at a different mutation not connected with protein trafficking that destroys neurons, we can't fix that by adding the drug. This is specific for the protein trafficking defects. So your next question should be, when's the clinical trial? And my answer will be, I have no idea because these are the two compounds we've got. They are thiophene thiolureas. And thiophene thiolureas, though pretty stable in vitro, and stable enough in cell culture to use as tool compounds are hideously, horribly, disgustingly unstable in vivo. The thiophene ring is more stable than we thought, but the thiourea arms rapidly open up and produce a host of nasty thiol species. There is no possibility that these compounds could ever be given to a human being. At the moment, we have been unable to find a modification of these compounds that has the two properties of being still potent and crossing the blood-brain barrier while being less toxic. We have not been able to optimize those properties. We're still trying. We're also looking at compounds that bind to those two other sites I showed you in the hope that we might be able to find lead compounds that do the same thing these molecules do, but that don't have the bad properties that we've got to deal with chemically. So we are still some distance away from being able to say that we have a compound that works in people. We are also trying other approaches to increase the level of retromer. We don't know if any of those would work. As soon as we have one that does work well in vivo, then a clinical trial is something we would very much like to do, but I think we'll do it for Parkinson's disease, not for Alzheimer's disease. See, an Alzheimer's clinical trial requires a thousand patients who've got to follow them for five, six, seven years. Because Alzheimer's proceeds at varying rates, and what you're measuring is cognition. I don't even know what that means. I certainly don't have, know how to measure it reliably without looking at a 1,000 patients and following them for years. But Parkinson's disease affects movement. There are well-defined, extremely reliable ways of measuring people's ability to move. And there are well-defined, easily reliable ways to do clinical trials for Parkinson's disease. A clinical trial that would cost $600 million to do for Alzheimer's disease can be done for $100 million or less in Parkinson's and it will take a third of the time and involve about a third of the patients, number of patients. So we want very much <coughs> to find a drug we can work with so we can do a Parkinson's clinical trial. Should the drug work for Parkinson's disease, it's a safe bet it could probably work for Alzheimer's. In any case, being used off-label by lots of people to try it on Alzheimer's will know one way or another. So to conclude, this is the team. A remarkable set of people we've really enjoyed working with. And this is the story. We have not yet got a molecule that we can take into people. I wish we had. But I think we have established that improving protein trafficking is likely to be a valid target for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, provided we can find a safe way of doing it. I know one thing. 
we better find a solution to this problem, or somebody better find a solution to this problem. Because the clock is ticking for all of our grandchildren. Thank you very much.